Okay. Is it seen? Yeah. Yes. Go to show. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Dr. Carol. And uh, hi to everyone. Namaste. Respected mentors, colleagues, friends, and all viewers. Uh, thank you for joining us. I would like to start this presentation today with this image that speaks thousands of words uh, during this phase of COVID. And I'm extremely happy to see everyone from all across the world uh, safe and healthy. Once again, hi to all. So going on to the uh, uh, topic for today is protocol-based management of islet sebaceous gland carcinoma. I have no financial disclosures or interest. So why did we choose islet uh, sebaceous gland carcinoma today uh, to discuss uh, regarding the protocol-based management? We all know that it's a malignant islet tumor. It is a lethal islet tumor. It can masquerade and it is common in Asian countries. So it holds very much importance to uh, discuss the protocol-based management of sebaceous gland carcinoma today. So going on to the few characteristic clinical features which, uh, before going on to the management that we need to be looking into in order to identify this lethal islet tumor is that it occurs in older age group. It arises from the meibomian glands of the tarsus. It's usually nodular, as you can see here in this uh, photograph, firm to hard mass, yellowish in color, there will be characteristic uh, loss of eyelashes and rounding of the lid margin. Intrinsic vascularity has to be looked for with feeder vessels, as you can see in this particular image over here, characteristic dilated feeder vessels, and they can be associated conjunctival congestion. But it's not the same always. Sebaceous gland carcinoma of the eyelid is considered to be a great masquerader. It can present as a cyst. It can present as a cutaneous horn. It can present as a small lump in the margin of the eyelid or even a blepharoconjunctivitis. So uh, what are the important things that you need to know and why sebaceous gland carcinoma is important is that it has a high recurrence rate if it's not treated properly. And mostly the recurrence is due to suboptimal surgical excision. Apart from this, the other things that is alarming is the regional lymph node metastasis reported to be as high as 30%. Systemic metastasis ranging from eight to 65% from various publication and the tumor related or the disease related mortality can be as high as 26%. So this is quite alarming regarding this lethal malignant islet tumor. So this was the first publication uh, way back in the early 80s by Dr. Rao, who actually published the prognostic factors related to sebaceous gland carcinoma. As you can see here, there are eight of them. It depends upon the duration of symptoms, the tumor diameter that we always talk about, and also including infiltrative pattern, multicentric origin, and histopathologically being poorly differentiated. The paper also spoke about certain features which led to poor prognostic factor as far as mortality is concerned when the size is more than 20 millimeters involving both upper lid and lower lid and also with orbital extension. But it's very, very important to have a universal guideline and a staging system in such malignant lethal eyelid lesion. Yes, we do have the AJCC TNM classification, the eighth edition, which has been modified. And this is how we prognosticate these tumors and also decide the management. So it's not too difficult. It's basically depending upon the size of the tumor and also the involvement, whether it is invading the tarsal plate or the eyelid margin and involving the full thickness of the eyelid. So anything which is less than 10 millimeters is T1, 10 to 20 millimeters is T2, and T3 is anything which is between 20 and 30 millimeters. That means it can cover the entire eyelid, as you can see in this image over here. Further subclassified as A, B, and C, 
as I told you before, depending upon the invasion of tarsal plate. If it is involved, it is B, no invasion is A. And if it is a full thickness involvement of the eyelid, then it comes to C. T4 is any tumor that invades the ocular, the intraocular or facial structures. Now, T4A are those with involves the ocular or intraocular, and T4B are those which spreads to the adjacent structures involving the paranasal sinus, nasal lacrimal system, or the brain. And it is very, very important to know this TNM classification in order to treat sebaceous gland carcinoma. Nodal positivity can be there, and metastasis has to be ruled out. So this is a very valuable publication that I came across, which has been recently published in Lancet Oncology from the United States of America, which involves a lot of practitioners involving dermatologists, pathologists, ocular oncologists, including Dr. Hakan and Dr. Carol Shields is also part of this, and uh, uh, various other uh, specialists in oncology, radiation oncology, and medical oncology. So they have come across with this prognostic factors, which says it can be a bad tumor. Clinical feature, according to the staging, T2C and above with nodal positivity, histopathological whenever there is poorly differentiate, poor differentiation, perineural invasion, and there are certain immunohistochemistry markers which has been identified that correlates to poor prognostic factors like high androgen receptor expression, PD-1 expression, et cetera. So what is basically the principles in the treatment of sebaceous gland carcinoma? It is same as any oncology principle. It's mainly surgical excision of the tumor, which is the primary goal in order to prevent recurrence and improve, uh, 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 improve the uh, uh, mortality uh, rate. Ancillary investigation does play a, a, a major role in the investigation part of sebaceous gland carcinoma as well, including computerized tomography, PET scan, and sentinel lymph node biopsy, which we will be talking in subsequent slides. So the indication of computerized tomography scan uh, as a protocol includes suspected orbital or paranasal sinus and lacrimal system involvement clinically that is suspecting. T2C or higher with clinically un undetected lymph node where you want to actually image the neck as well. And of course, with a positive lymph node. Any tumor that involves the caruncle, it's not only the eyelid that the sebaceous gland carcinoma can arise from, it can also arise from the caruncle. So any tumor arising from the caruncle also mandates an imaging because they can be orbital extension. Indication of PET scan includes, again, any tumor which is T2C or higher with a positive lymph node and a suspected systemic metastasis. Protocols in the management per se, as I told you, it's a complete extirpation of the tumor, making sure that the margins are clear with frozen section or most micrographic surgery, pathological confirmation of diagnosis with fixed section, including the margin positivity and negativity, and adjuvant treatment that includes in the management of sebaceous gland carcinoma are cryotherapy, mitomycin C, and radiotherapy. We'll come to that later. And in advanced disease, we do have indication for radiotherapy and systemic chemotherapy. So this is exactly how we go ahead with primary excision biopsy. And from various literature, it has been seen that a margin of four millimeters up to six millimeters is included. And in our clinical practice, we include four millimeter margin on either side of the clinically clear margin of the tumor uh, in the anterior lamella as well as the posterior lamella, as you can see here in the image. So frozen section technique is our uh, favorite technique. We do not uh, do most micrographic surgery uh, quite uh, usually in our practice. Uh, so immediately the tumor after excision is sent to the pathologist and then we wait for the results from the pathologist to confirm whether the margins are negative or positive before we go ahead with the reconstruction of the eyelid. If it's a large lesion and considered to be diffuse, where clinically you are not sure about the margins, we do take extra margins and then send it separately to the pathologist. 
And why do we consider margin control very important in sebaceous gland carcinoma? We did evaluate and assess a series of 107 cases in way back in 2014. And we found that without frozen section, the uh, recurrence rate was 38% when compared to 13% with frozen section. So it really holds uh, a lot of uh, validity in doing frozen section margin control with uh, a sebaceous gland carcinoma. So this is a case of T1B with N0 and M0. The tumor is not too large. So what was done here was again, a margin clearance of four millimeters with uh, upper lid uh, reconstruction. And she's doing fine at three years post-surgical excision without recurrence. Similar case, this was a case of recurrence of tumor with a history of incision and curatage for a chalazion three times and an excision biopsy once and the tumor uh, recurring again. And this is where you can actually see uh, in the middle of the tumor where uh, the excision biopsy has been done earlier and then she recurred, which requires extensive excision and reconstruction. So this is the case post-operatively after a cutler beard uh, reconstruction of a large lower lid sebaceous gland carcinoma. The most important thing which can go unnoticed as far as sebaceous gland carcinoma can be, and which I really want to uh, uh, press upon in this uh, presentation is such subtle presentation as in this patient where she had chronic blepharoconjunctivitis involving the angle, the lateral canthus, part of the lower lid and the upper lid. And this has not been uh, 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 responding to any of topical medication where initially she was diagnosed as a case of blepharoconjunctivitis, although it is very asymmetric to have a blepharoconjunctivitis in one eye and the other eye being normal. So there was a high suspicion of pegetoid spread of sebaceous gland carcinoma in this case clinically, and uh, it came out to be an intraepithelial invasion or pegetoid variant. So in this particular situation, we actually take the protocols in a slightly different way so the first step when you suspect a pegetoid variant in sebaceous gland carcinoma would be MAP biopsy. So we do take a two into two millimeter uh, uh, tissue biopsies from various part of the ocular surface, including the bulbar conjunctiva, the fornix, including the upper, the lower, and the tarsal conjunctiva, and most often the carincula. So we come to around seven, 16 to 17 specimen from an eyeball in order to rule out a pegetoid spread in sebaceous gland carcinoma. And this is how we go about. So how do we decide whether we have to do a MAP biopsy in a case of sebaceous gland carcinoma? Well, of course, in a case where the nodule is very well defined, we may not uh, recommend a, a MAP biopsy in such a case, but when there is a tumor in a eyelid, whether it's upper lid or lower lid, associated with diffuse congestion in and around the tumor and at a distant place, other than the tumor involving the fornix or the bulba conjunctiva, MAP biopsy is mandated. How do you treat a pegetoid variant of sebaceous gland carcinoma? Of course, with surgical excision. Posterior lamella excision has been uh, uh, extensively done and there has been uh, excellent work from the Shields group on posterior lamella excision in such situation. And if you have a recurrence or a positive margin in a pegetoid spread, cryotherapy and mitomycin C can also be considered. Cryotherapy for conjunctival uh, SGC, but not for eyelid invasive SGC. Now, going on to neoadjuvant chemotherapy, when is it indicated? So neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we propose systemic chemotherapy uh, uh, that is usually used in head and neck tumors uh, by head and neck oncologist. 5-fluorouracil, paclitaxel, and cisplatin is given three to six cycles. And the main aim of uh, giving a neoadjuvant chemotherapy in such extensive disease is basically to chemo reduce, chemo reduction, reducing the size of the tumor as much it can be surgically amenable for complete excision with a clear margin. And that's why we use neoadjuvant chemotherapy. 
Sometimes stereotactic radiotherapy is also added along with systemic chemotherapy and uh, excision biopsy uh, in sebaceous gland carcinoma. Well, of course, if systemic metastasis is proven, systemic chemotherapy is also indicated. Stereotactic radiotherapy, uh, monotherapy with radiation, well, uh, the indications are not really laid down uh, accurately. There are uh, certain uh, case reports who have uh, used radiotherapy in cases which is not surgically amenable and you had to treat the tumor. Well, we do use stereotactic radiotherapy uh, in, ca in case of orbital uh, uh, a sebaceous gland carcinoma extending into the orbital, orbit or paranasal sinus with perineural invasion, bony invasion, even after excentration, if it is proven that the bone is invaded, a radiotherapy is indicated. And of course, in the presence of uh, neck lymph node uh, involvement, uh, radiotherapy to the neck is also indicated. Now, going on to a destructive surgical procedure like excentration, we do not uh, uh, prefer too often. Uh, we al always prefer to uh, uh, salvage the eye as much as possible. But well, there are situations where there is extensive orbital extension. And in this case, the patient has recurrent sebaceous gland carcinoma involving the upper lid. As you can see here, there is a large lump in the lower lid, although the proptosis is not that uh, evident here with very minimal orbital extension and a diffuse intraepithelial spread. So these are the indications when we would consider excentration in sebaceous gland carcinoma. Indication of sentinel lymph node biopsy, yes, it has been addressed in, there has been uh, more than 100 cases where sentinel lymph node biopsy has been done from various reports. Uh, so the indication of sentinel lymph node biopsy in sebaceous gland carcinoma is any tumor more than 10 millimeters in the greatest horizontal diameter and 10 uh, T2C or higher. So uh, before I come uh, to the end of my uh, presentation here, one thing that I really, really want to address here is in any doubtful situation of sebaceous gland carcinoma, a histopathological evaluation is a must. So this was a case of recurrent uh, chalazion uh, in a in a 67 year old lady, where of course there is kind of a suspicion of a sebaceous gland carcinoma arising from the tarsus. So whenever you do an incision curatage repeatedly in such situation, the specimen has to be sent for histopathological evaluation. And in certain situation, when there is suspicion, you do a biopsy and it comes as indeterminate, repeat the biopsy again. And certain studies have considered immunohistochemistry uh, uh, factors like androgen receptor positivity, nuclear factor 13A, adipophilin and perilipin also confirming the diagnosis. So uh, basically uh, coming to the end of the presentation, protocol-based management in sebaceous gland carcinoma is very, very important. And we consider primary wide surgical excision as a gold standard. Surgical pro protocols has to be obeyed because this reduces the recurrence and improve uh, the life uh, span of the patient. Uh, Neoadjuvant chemotherapy and radiotherapy does have uh, uh, a place in the management of sebaceous gland carcinoma, but indicated. And uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your patient listening. And uh, I can take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Farooz. That was a wonderful talk on a challenging subject. And I know you have immense experience in India, far more than we have in the US uh, with sebaceous carcinoma. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Carroll. Thank you so much. Can you stop sharing the screen first? Yes. So we have one more quiz question coming up. This is the third question. You see this particular lesion on the eyelid of this child. He's an infant, of course. What is this associated with? Face syndrome, lumbar syndrome, none of the above, both the above. You can send your response as question three and your choice of the key, A, B, C, or D, to the WhatsApp number that's given. Thank you. The screen is not shared, Dr. Santosh? It's not shared? Oh, no, no. We are seeing you.
as A, B, C, and D. Okay. 